everyone, it's Mrs. Van, your friendly neighborhood English teacher, and guess what? Today, I'm out in the neighborhood. <laughs> you are not gonna believe what happened today. So about uh, just over an hour ago, um, my husband and I were both working from home like normal, and both of us got kicked off the internet. And I was thinking, oh, it's just being glitchy for a second, and so I went and um, I just started reading a chapter in a book I needed to read for work and I thought, oh, the internet, it will resolve itself. And we have somebody doing work in the yard, digging out these big bushes. And my husband said, I wonder if he cut the internet cable. And I'm like, I didn't say this to my husband, but I was thinking, gosh, like, why do you already have to go to DEF CON 1? Like, <laughs> but guess what? The guy had cut the internet cable. <laughs> We didn't have any internet and so I called my friend Patty and I said guess what our internet cable just got cut and so I am sitting in the dining room of my friend Patty's house and she wants to have the class so this is Patty's dining room and her pretty cabinet and hutch so welcome to Patty's house I like being here and I hope that you do too so that's why we're in a new environment today no internet so 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 crazy so um anyway i know your day and then um right before i came over i went out and stood we live on a cul-de-sac and i went and stood out on the cul-de-sac and the blue angels flew over and uh, like when i say over i mean right over i was looking up and i could see the underbelly of all of the jets it was so incredible and um anyway i will be i'll be back um to my regular venue next week assuming right and uh yeah so uh let's jump in you guys i'm so excited about today i am so excited about today um yes adapt i like that we need that hashtag adapt so here is our book that we're going to be starting his majesty's dragon and i screenshotted uh the little snippet from Goodreads. And you can see that on Goodreads, it has 4.05 stars. Now, I do not recommend that you go to Goodreads to look at reviews on this because the first review is of useless profanity from someone who didn't have a good English teacher and doesn't know enough words. But I have a curiosity about this. So I went and pulled, I just took a screenshot of some people who rated it five stars. They absolutely loved it. Got it and then screenshotted some people who rated it one star, one star. And so um, the, yeah, um, uh, my question for you is, what do you think about ratings? Are you someone who reads the reviews and ratings before you read a book or do you wait until after the book is read or do you get to a point in the book and you think, I don't even like this book and then you go read ratings to find out like, yeah, nobody else liked it either. Like, what do you do? Okay, so um, I'm looking at, my video is a little glitchy, but the audio is fine. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, thank you, Simon Hay Sutton, about the, liking the picture of the video. Cookie Cookie liked it too. And I'll mention, um, I'll be back home next week. They're going to fix our internet sometime this afternoon, which is just like a miracle. Um, so I'm seeing some interesting uh, feedback. So some people think internet... Ratings are overrated. Some of you um, like that, yeah. So the uh, video, remember, if you're just joining us for the first time, I'm about seven seconds ahead of you in an alternate universe. You guys come in after seven. Yeah, okay, so Fiona waits until after she reads the book, um, and Kira's the same way. Interesting, yeah. Okay, so here we go. Uh, we already did that, one to five rings. All right, so let's look at last week. What was happening last week? So many great comments. So Cookie Cookie said, if Mrs. Van Star likes it, I like it. And Cookie Cookie, this is a lovely but very dangerous attitude because what if I like stuff that um, you don't like? Like, I really like Brussels sprouts. So I'm curious about, um, oh, Will, the future is fantastic. The future is beautiful. You're gonna love it in the future. Um, okay, so is there anything that you really like that most people don't like in food? 
So I love Brussels sprouts. Do any of you love food um, that other people don't love? So I'm curious about that. And Cookie Cookie might be nervous. And okay, then next, Will said, my room is often confused with a small library. And I think, Will, that that is probably one of the most lovely problems to have. That's awesome. Hey, Molly, we can be Brussels sprouts friends. Um, and thank you, Deb Cotney, for keeping everybody up to date with what's going on. Okay, um, and <laughs> this was so funny. When um, TechnoCow changed their internet or changed their YouTube name from TechnoCow to Iridescent Moose in the middle of the class last week. So that was so amazing. Um, okay, so I'm looking at some of your foods and I love everything you've said. Okay, shout out for lentils, right? The cheese curls dipped in applesauce, I don't know about that. But I will tell you, one of my daughters-in-law, she has a genius trick for eating Cheetos. She uses chopsticks. And then your hands don't get covered with that. She eats hot Cheetos with chopsticks. So look at how many of you like Brussels sprouts. Somebody hates butter. Yeah, a lot of people don't like to make... <gasps> the person who loves the orange circus peanuts. I love those. Oh, you guys, we could just talk food all day long. Okay, anyway, Jason, books are better than Facebook. End of discussion. Jason, I think that needs to be a bumper sticker. And then um, just another fangirl on the internet said, Mrs. Van in here. And I do have to tell you, I notice in the chat when you guys join in and I get so excited when I see you. Um, that's so fun. Uh, yeah, I love sushi too, Jay Sand. And then I'm just so excited about these Brussels sprouts fans. Um, all right, Juliet Khan said, I think that this story is a little unrealistic and Sam always succeeds on his first try and he never gets sick. And so many people are okay with him leaving home. I agree with you on every single point. Um, it doesn't make me like the story any less, but I think, Juliet, that you point out something important, which is that as readers, one of the things we do is say, in what ways is this author writing in a way we don't believe? Like, what are they asking us to swallow that we're like, <clears throat> don't think so? And I think you hit on a number of them in this book, right? Like. It's true. He never gets sick. Well, he does get sick once, right? Do you remember he gets scurvy? Um, but he instantly cures himself because he instinctively knows to eat liver, which I did a Mythbusters on. Um, so I think you're right. And good call. There you go. Um, then the next one is Elizabeth Hires. We still love you, typers and all. English teacher fail. So we got a, a hashtag last week of English teacher fail because I think I had at least three and maybe four typos. So let's see how many... I have that on. Okay, and then I loved this at the end. I, I just loved this. When I read through all the comments, this was, I just made me all. So Jason said, I think it's so amazing that after a short month, we have connected with each other. I didn't expect to have so many friends that I talked to on FaceTime all the time from this. Thank you, Mrs. Vansar. And then just another girl on the interwebs responded, couldn't put it better myself. I thought this would just be some boring thing I wouldn't enjoy, but look at me now. And I just love that. That just made me so happy. I'm so glad that you guys have made this community of friends for yourselves and you've bonded over this shared interest. And I think it's going to last way beyond the class. Like, it's so great. And I, I hope that when you look back and think about this whole COVID experience, that that this is like what what reminds you, you know. Um, okay, so I see a question from Madeline asking, what was the climax of the book? And I think that's a good question. Probably the climax of the book, truly, if I were going to write it out as an English teacher arc, would be when he survives the snowstorm. Uh, interestingly, the book starts with that. But I think if I were going to plot out the whole plot on that, it was that because that was when he knew he could do it. Um, that was when he knew that he had conquered his fears, he had developed the skills and implemented them, and so I would argue that that's it. So, so nice. Um, and then the hashtags. Okay, the hashtags. So there are way more than this. There are way more than this. In fact, Cookie Cookie, I want you to email me all of them, but we were talking about, um, earlier I put in the comments, like, yeah, we, we, I'm a, totally in agreement with these hashtags, and I think we need a t-shirt. I think we need a t-shirt with all these hashtags. Okay, you guys were amazing with the grammar goodness. 
anybody, you guys were amazing with the grammar goodness last week. So if you remember that we did this out of, this was a line from the story, out of the sea from a pin of a thing would, and this was like fly or dive my beautiful falcon or whatever. But we had, these were a bunch of the verbs, adjectives and nouns that you guys came up with. And it was where we get some of our new favorites, Stroopy McNugget and Iridescent Moose. So so if any of you would like to make even any more words, then you could just take a quick screenshot of this and here were all of your choices and see what kinds of combinations you could make. Um, oh, oh, is it supposed to be Faclon? Okay, I got it. Okay, there we go. Um, and then Jeanette was sad and a bunch of you were sad and a bunch of you were like, Mrs. Van, you're making me sad at the end. And I do that on purpose. You guys, you guys, you have to feel something when you end a book. You have to feel something. You want to be a little bit sad. It's like leaving an, a friend, right? And and you need to be a little bit sad. You got to get the feels so that it sticks with you. If you just finish a book and you're like, eh, put the book down, walk away, then it won't, it won't have the power that it needs in your life. Okay, ready to dive in today? We're going to be looking at His Majesty's Dragon. You know how we looked at my um, the other side of the mountain with... Um, through the lens of can you ever really run away and what does it mean to be self-reliant this book we're going to look at through a prism instead of two different lenses we're going to look at it through a three-sided prism of friendship luck and strategy so as you are reading um that's what we're going to be looking at um yes jay sand i see you i totally agree we need some merch all right, so let's meet Napoleon. If this guy had had his way, we'd all be speaking Francais. All right, so first thing, I want you to get uh, ready to make some guesses. So I'm going to ask you something, and it's going to be either true or false, and I want you to guess if it's true or false, and they're all about Napoleon. True or false, Napoleon loved licorice. I'll pause for a second to give you guys a chance to make a guess. You don't need to type it in the, you don't need to type it in the chat, but just think in your head. I mean, you can type it in the chat if you want to, but um, true or false, Napoleon loved licorice. And the answer to that is true. He did. He loved licorice so much that he constantly smelled of licorice. And when he was dying, all he wanted was licorice water. Um, and True fact, also, I hate black licorice, and so Napoleon can have all of mine. I like red licorice, and I like purple licorice, but I and green even, but I do not like black licorice. I'm curious, do any of you like black licorice? Curious. Black licorice. I think it's one of those things that you either like it or you really don't. All right, true or false, Napoleon is the one who coined the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. I'll give you a second. False, but he said something like it. What he did say is a good sketch is better than a long speech. And I think that's true. <laughs> a good sketch is better than a long speech. Yes, Aaron, I like Twizzlers too. Mmm, I like Twizzlers too. Oh, Anna, you already speak French. There you go. You didn't need Napoleon. See? Okay. Oh, yeah. There we go. A, a bunch of people don't like Napoleon or don't like black licorice. All right. True or false? Napoleon cheated at cards. I'll give you a second. True. He was such a cheater. His mom would call him out on it all the time because he was always cheating and he was really known for it. And I think that's pretty bad. Um, oh, okay. True or false. Napoleon had beautiful hands. True or false. Give you a second. And the answer is true, true, absolutely. He had such pretty hands that people said, even his valet said that he had the hands of a woman, like that his hands were so delicate and he always kept them really manicured and they were super soft. And it's kind of weird for a military guy, but he had really beautiful hands. Random. I know, right? Yeah, can you imagine? I see that. Good question, Aaron. Like, imagine having that reputation as being someone who's a cheater. All right, true or false, Napoleon put his hand in his coat in all of the paintings because he had an ulcer. True or false? Give you a second. False. 
not true. It, it's something that is really commonly said, but it was actually just a common pose for portrait painters at that time, and especially the painter Jacques-Louis David, who created the most famous painting of Napoleon that was painted in 1811. And he used that in a lot of the people he painted, and it just stuck. But a lot of people say, oh, he was holding his ulcer, and that's just not true. So now you know. Yeah, pretty hands. There we go. Bubblegum flavored licorice. What? I didn't even know that was a thing. Oh, Deb Coney, I think it's better to have hands that are hard working hands. All right, true or false, Napoleon was short. And true or false, give you a second to answer. False. Nope. In fact, he has a reputation for being false. In fact, or for being short, we even have a saying, right? Like a Napoleon, a Napoleon complex when um, someone is short and they go around all arrogant. We say, oh, he has a Napoleon complex because theoretically Napoleon was short, but nope. He was um, apparently 1.67 meters tall, um, which is short for now, but it was probably slightly above average for Europeans at the time. So kind of interesting. Next question, true or false? Napoleon kidnapped the Pope. Ooh. This is my favorite. True. Napoleon's officers kidnapped Pope Pius VII and they held him captive for um, five whole years. Like, that's a pretty big deal when you kidnap the Pope, right? Random. You guys, if you are ever on like um, Jeopardy, which like prayers to Alex Trebek, right? But if you are ever on Jeopardy, you are going to blow away the competition with your Napoleonic knowledge. But yeah, it's true. Kidnap the Pope. True thing. True or false. In France, it's illegal to name a pig Napoleon. True or false. I'll give you a second. This is the last one, you guys. This is the last one. And ready? True. It's true. It's a holdover from the Napoleonic Code. Now, interestingly, for those of you who've read Animal Farm, you know that George Orwell named a main character in Animal Farm Napoleon. But here's what's really tricksty. Orwell named the pig, the pig, Napoleon, but that pig was actually not based on the character of Napoleon. He was based on the character of the real life person, Joseph Stalin. So random. Alex Trebek is the host of Jeopardy and a true saint. Um, yeah, <laughs> the game hound. Is that a sin? I think it's a sin <laughs> to like kidnap the Pope. Yeah, I think it's a pretty bad one. <laughs> All right. So how did you do? How did you do? Did you get some of them right? Did you get some of them right? It's fun to guess, right? Okay. So let's look at Napoleon. Do you guys know that song by Five for Fighting called When You Only Got a, uh, like, I think it's called A Hundred Years and it's like When You Only Got A Hundred Years to Live. I absolutely love that song. And um, so I'm gonna go through, what do you do when you only got 51 years to live, which is how long Napoleon lived. And when you learn what he did in his life, you will be blown a period way, period. Okay, so this is what you do. You become an emperor and one of the greatest commanders in history, you know, as one does. Okay, so let's see. This is what's going on with our pal Napoleon. Now, his his last name when he was first born was not actually Bonaparte. It was Buenaparte because his family was Italian. So he was born on this island where you see the red marker. That island is called Corsica. And he was born there in August of 1759. Now, at that time, Corsica had just recently been turned over to French control. It had been controlled by the like city-state of Genoa, and the Genoese had ceded control of it to France. So it's now a French holding, but Napoleon's family was actually Italian um, by, by uh, like heritage, his ethnicity, his ancestry is actually Italian. So um, I love maps. I don't know. You're going to see some maps today. Do any of you love maps? Like, I don't know if my mom's in here today or not, but my mom taught me to love maps and I love maps. I just love looking at maps. Not as much online maps, but paper maps. I just love me a paper map. Ooh, nice one. Napoleon blow apart. Very nice. Very nice. Oh, yeah. Genoa Salami. Exactly. Same thing. 
same thing. Good call, you guys. All right, so anybody else like maps? Waiting to see your answer, yeah. All right, so this is a picture. These are a couple of pictures of the island of Corsica. Corsica is the fourth largest island in the Mediterranean. Um, so it's it's big. The only islands that are bigger are Sicily, Sardinia, and Cyprus. Those are the only islands that are bigger. So it's pretty big. Um, and his dad, Napoleon's dad, was a lawyer. His family had um, Emma was like ancient nobility. So he was like kind of a middle class family, but they had had noble roots. And they had emigrated to Corsica a couple of hundred years earlier. And again, both of his parents were Italian. And when, when Napoleon first went to France to go to school, he really considered himself a foreigner. He did not consider himself French. Oh, you guys, I'm loving looking at your responses to um, maps. Oh, Simon, all my kids are Eagle Scouts. That's so cool. Yeah. Oh, you guys, we could talk maps. Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, so Napoleon gets sent to France to school and he goes to a couple different schools and then he ends up here. This is called the École Militaire, Militaire the École Militaire in Paris and it is literally military school and it's still standing. You can go visit it. It's enormous. So you can see two different views of it here and see this complex is absolutely astonishingly large. Now, it is not... Um, it gets confused because it's the same style, but it is not the same place as Les Invalides, which is where Napoleon is actually buried. So, but And that's right by the Eiffel Tower. So if you've ever been to Paris, you're standing on the Tour Eiffel, you look down the green like mall, the grass, and then there's Les Invalides there, and that's where Napoleon's buried. This is on the other side of town. Um, I think it's in the 7th arrondissement. Um, so while he was there, his dad died and Napoleon was only 15 years old and he wasn't even the oldest kid in the family. He was a second kid, but he wasn't even the oldest kid, but he was the one who ended up taking over the family. So he's not even yet 16 and he becomes the head of the family. And he, by the way, he was not very good at school. He graduated from the Ecole Militaire. I may not be saying that right. My, I, I have been told that my French sounds like I have a Spanish accent. <laughs> Um, but I, I speak some French and some Spanish and German, and so it gets all messed up. Um, so the, um, he graduated 42nd in a class of 58. So not so great, not so great. All right, now, during the French Revolution, though, he quickly rises through the military ranks. And in fact, he was only 24 years old when he became a general. I mean, that's not normal, people. That is not not normal. And there, after he became a general, there were just all the, you know, I don't know what happened to the older brother. You guys are asking a really good question. I should probably go like, look at, look it up. Why him and not his brother? I don't know. Um, but it, during the French Revolution, he just rose through the ranks. He becomes a general. And after the revolution, he is, there are a bunch of machinations that follow this. And I mean, you could go read a really good biography of the, of him and it would be worth it because he's really interesting and then when he's 30 years old we have this a coup d'etat now a coup d'etat a coup d'etat and yes i see your your german spelling but yeah ja, ich spreche deutsch so this whale of a word is coup d'etat so a coup d'etat is the forcible removal of an existing government in power right and you have to use violence so you can have a regular coup you can have a coup that isn't violent but a coup d'etat literally a coup of state a coup d'etat is violent so um a coup d'etat will always be violent and the coup it's called the coup of 18 brumaire, brumaire which is how they did the years during the french revolution so during that year, it brought Napoleon to power and his title was then first consul. And in the view of most historians, it is this event, this coup d'etat that puts Napoleon in power that is the end of the French Revolution. Um, it's a bloodless coup, but it's violent and it overthrows the directory. And the directory was who was running France at the end of the French Revolution and it puts into power the French consulate, and it happened in 1799. Um, so 
that is what happens. And this is a beautiful painting of Napoleon. Do any of you recognize the building there on the left? I know Anna will. Um, Kudit has a whale of a word, Anna, because it's confused. Like, it's, it's also French. We get a lot of our words from French, um, from the French in English, but um, coup d'etat is often confused. People will say coup when they mean coup d'etat and they'll say coup d'etat when they mean coup. So you have to know that violence is the key word. Um, and then I'm looking to see if any of you recognize this. It is Notre Dame. Yes, it is. And this is a painting of the day that Napoleon arrives at Notre Dame in order to be like crowned, essentially. So there he is. Of course, Notre Dame, Notre Dame had a tragic fire. Um, so he spends the next decade at war in a series of wars called the, wait for it, Napoleonic Wars. <laughs> now there are actually a lot of wars and some wars are not called Napoleonic Wars because there's like one of the Napoleonic Wars he inherited. There were some other conflicts that were going on already. So not every, but anyway, we call it the Napoleonic Wars against different coalitions of governments in Europe. And over the next 10 years, he completely revitalizes the French army, which he calls the Grand Armée. And he turns it into a million strong, super hyper organized force. And he divides it into corps, spelled C-O-R-P-S. And the corps that he divided in it, almost every army in the world still uses the organizational structure that Napoleon set up. It's so amazing. Yes, Natasha, a fifth of his life he was in th these wars. It was crazy. And you know, his life was never the same. And back to the maps, at the height of his control over Europe, you, can you see this red outline? Everything inside the red outline was controlled by Napoleon. That's a whole lot of Napoleon, <laughs> right? Like, look at this. I mean, it's amazing. It's France, it's Spain, of course, Corsica, some other smaller islands in the Mediterranean, the empire of Austria, which now we think of Austria as like, just like only famous for sound and music and Mozart, but the Austrian empire, and especially when it was the Austro-Hungarian empire, tremendously powerful. And also you see all of Italy, big parts of Prussia, a lot of what is now, what, everything that is now Germany, Poland, a lot of the Baltic states, Denmark, everything, Luxembourg, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, I like name it, Andorra, like all these, all these countries, all the things, Switzerland, all of this was under his power. I mean, he controlled the world almost, like all of the world that was Western, except for Portugal, the UK, and then the Ottoman Empire and Russia. Like you see, this is like a lot. A lot of Napoleon. Yes, Riley says it's bigger than Germany was in World War II. Yes. And you are also right, Cloudfall, not as great as Alexander's empire or the Roman Empire when it fully went out. But and the Holy Roman Empire is still in existence. I mean, it is crazy. So yeah. Okay, so in 1806, Napoleon has this built. This is the Arc de Triomphe. It's it's actually technically called the Arc de triomphe d'étoile because it's at the star where all these roads come together if you look at it from the sky you can see all these roads in paris and um multiple sections of paris called arrondissements all meet together at the arc de triomphe but this he he napoleon had this built and it was to honor the those who had fought and died in both the french revolution and the napoleonic wars and all of the French victories and the names of all the generals are carved on the inner and outer surfaces. So if you ever get to um, go there, yeah, like Jason, Cloudfall, I'm glad you're picking up on that. You only have 51 years to live. Like, I mean, it's just astonishing what he accomplished in that time. It's just absolutely amazing. Okay, so another thing he did that was not genius. So while he's taking over tons of territory in Europe, he's literally giving it away. In the United States. So it was Napoleon that sold the United States the land that is the Louisiana Purchase. So um, he sells it for $15 million, which was $18 per square mile. So absolutely amazing. Um, Thomas Jefferson was the president. Jefferson really, really, really wanted this. 
what he really what he really wanted was Louisiana, and he wanted the port of New Orleans. Um, and what he got was this. Now, what I would say is nominally purchased, meaning in name only. Why? Because a lot of the land that you see is uh, was at that time controlled by and inhabited by Native Americans, by American Indians, and so. Um, that was like he sold land that he didn't really have. So there we go. And yeah, Alexander was only 32. I mean, some of these guys are young when they do this crazy stuff. All right. So in 1812, Napoleon, remember, he comes to power in 1799. In 1812, he makes this really bad decision. And uh, other people have made this bad decision. Hitler makes the same mistake over 100 years later, which is, I think I'll go invade me some Russia. Yeah, guess what? That never worked. Oh, I love that. And you get seven states. And you get seven states. Ooh, that's a good one, Cloudball. Um, he, he invades Russia. Spoiler, that hardly ever works out for you people. Um, do not invade Russia. It hardly ever goes anywhere. And it's a disaster for him. He ends up fighting this tragic Battle of Leip Leipzig, which he loses. And the coalition fighting against him invades France, and he abdicates. And that is kind of the end for a moment, right? He gets exiled to the island of Elba. He gets sent to Elba, and he's like a prisoner there. He's in exile. But Elba's only 30 miles away from Corsica. So he's only 30 miles, like 50 kilometers away from his home island. And he still has people who want him. Yeah. Oh, yes, um, the idea that history just repeats itself. Everyone makes the same mistakes, yes. People go to Russia and they die from cold. You're exactly right, Anna. That's exactly what happens. Russians in winter, yeah, never try, never invade Russia. There is a good hashtag, never invade Russia. So what happens is he escapes. He escapes the island of Elba. And here's a painting of him leaving Elba. And he gets taken back. I love this painting. I love this painting. So the ship that Napoleon is on is um, called the, the Inconstant, which I think is hysterical. It's called the Inconstant. And it is ferrying Napoleon to France. It is the one flying the French flag there on the right. The other ship is flying the white flag of the monarchy. And it, anyway, so... Um, and that began what is called the Hundred Days War, or sometimes called the War of the Seventh Coalition. So a lot of the Napoleonic Wars, not all of them, but a lot of the Napoleonic Wars were named by the groups of people fighting against Napoleon. So there's like the War of the First Coalition, which actually he didn't start, he inherited. And then like the War of the Third Coalition, and the Fourth Coalition, and the Fifth Coalition. And the coalitions were different groups of countries. And you can find charts anywhere of the different countries that were fighting together as different coalitions trying to fight against Napoleon. So the um, Hundred Days War is also called the War of the Seventh Coalition. And this is the last group of people who are going to get together again. And England is in, the UK is in all but I think one of the coalitions. And it lasts now. Um, it goes from March 20th of 1815 until July 8th of 1815 and which is technically 111 days but we call it the 100 days war and at the end of that war Napoleon loses Napoleon loses and he loses at a very famous battle called Waterloo and you've probably heard of this battle and in fact it's become a name for something like the phrase your Waterloo is like where you're gonna go meet your ultimate defeat and that's what happens to Napoleon. He meets his ultimate defeat at the Battle of Waterloo. And, um, <laughs> okay, that is hysterical, Anna. There's nothing wrong with being a polite nation that is able to stand the cold. I love that. That is awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. That should be like a, a slogan for Canada, like on their t-shirt. Like, there's no, well, you need a sweatshirt. But there's nothing wrong with being a polite nation that likes cold. I love that. So Waterloo, he loses. This is the final loss that does him in forever. The British exile him to this island. Um, this is an island so small, I had to just grab my own map here. Um, and this is the island of St. Helena. And in the island of St. Helena, um, he stays there. It's, it's here in the Atlantic. The British had taken over this island um, in 1653 
and they didn't know exactly what to do with it until they needed to put a despot there. Let's put an exiled dictator here. He will not get back. You notice the difference between where he was up here and now he's way down here. They're not taking any chances this time. So he's exiled there in 1815 and he stays there until his death in 1821. And that's a painting of Napoleon looking longingly out over the sea. So he's really only there for like six years. So, um, I think, yeah. Okay, do you, my question for you, do you like history? Do you like history? I just love, yeah, unless you're the Mongols, that's a good one, William. Um, oh, I'm just loving these. Duke of Wellington, hard pounding this gentleman. Let's see who will pound longer. Ooh, yes. Oh, you guys, there are so many great books to read about this. So many great books. The Duke of Wellington is so amazing. Yeah, no swimming back to Corsica now, right? Um, so yes, we all have a Waterloo. Yeah. Mm. Oh, you guys, I'm loving these comments. So curious if you like history. Um, I, but even if you don't like history, you can still love this book because it's like a 10 on a scale of 1 to 8 coolness. So I really like this book. Um, yeah, so Sophie, is Waterloo like an Achilles heel? In some ways, right? An Achilles heel is something that's always your weakness. Um, whereas Waterloo is like the final showdown where like you lose everything. Your Achilles heel, you may not necessarily lose. It's just a weakness, but I love that. Yeah. Well, hopefully you liked, even for those of you who aren't necessarily history fans, hopefully you liked that because now we're ready to meet our book. Yeah, he's not really short. I'm just looking at some of your stuff. History's fun sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is so fun. I love reading your comments, you guys. Okay, so here's our book, His Majesty's Dragon, written by Naomi Novik. And you know what, you guys? I actually like sent her a message through her website. Like, will you please come visit our class? But she didn't respond to me. So, oh, well. Um, but I tried. So um, this book is an interesting genre. I tried to decide what I would call it. And I think you could call it any of these genres. So the first genre I think that it fits in is epic fantasy. And I'll explain more about that in the next picture. Um, oh, Cookie Cookie, I'm so happy, happy for you that you got the paperback. So it's an epic fantasy. It is full on world building. If you like fantasy and you like world building, you're gonna like this. There are lots of rules. There's lots of trivia. There's lots of locations. There's lots of history of the thing. There's full on world building here. And if you like that, it's awesome. And then um, alternate history. It is also an alternate history because it's essentially the alternate an alternate history of the Napoleonic Wars. And then it's magical realism because magical realism is where everything in the book is kind of real, but there's maybe one or two things that are weird. So like maybe the animals can talk or people can fly or something like that. I would say Harry Potter is in some ways magical realism because there's a lot in Harry Potter that's very, very real. But then there's the there are these elements of magic, right? Like so sometimes people are working really hard. Like, do you remember in the book when they are cleaning out Sirius's house and they're all just working so hard and they're exhausted? And and yet every now and then they use magic. And so it's like, okay. And and I think this book is somewhat like that. Like there's there's magical realism because everything else is normal except there are dragons and they talk. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, you guys can send messages to the author. So the reason I would call it an epic fantasy is that she's actually written nine full-length novels. These are eight of them. The ninth one came out last year. And she's going to maybe do some more shorter pieces related to it. She said the ninth novel is the last novel. Now, one interesting thing, Peter Jackson, who did Lord of the Rings, actually optioned these novels to make a movie of, but then he realized he couldn't do it justice. He, he was like, it would be too much. It would have to be too big, too much. And so he released it, so we'll see. But if you guys like this book and you like series, then you're in luck because this one has it. And the entire book, the entire book asks, takes this quote from John Jervis, who was the first Earl of St. Vincent. I do not say the French cannot come. I only say they cannot come by sea. And he was an admiral in the Royal Navy and uh, also a member of parliament. 
and he served through the later half of the 18th century and into the 19th century. And he was an active commander during um, the Seven Years' War, the American Revolutionary War, or War for Independence, as it is called there, the French Revolutionary War, and the Napoleonic Wars. He served in all of these wars. He is the most interesting man. And you know what? This guy is super amazing, and nobody has written a decent biography of him. So any of you who like history, make a little note to yourself that I should write a really good biography of John Jervis because he is fascinating, absolutely fascinating man. But when he said this, this is where Naomi Novik kind of jumps off. She's like, I can't come by sea. What if they came by air on dragons? And that's the whole premise of the book. That's the whole premise of the book. The book asks the question, what would the Napoleonic Wars have been like if there had been dragons? So this is the little snippet from Penguin, which is the publisher of the book. And it says, when HMS Reliant captures a French frigate and seizes its precious cargo, an unhatched dragon egg, and, and it has, its, its precious cargo is an unhatched dragon egg. Fate sweeps Captain Will Lawrence from his seafaring life into an uncertain future and an unexpected kinship with a most extraordinary creature. And so that's the premise of the book. It's so amazing. It's so amazing. Okay, so questions I know people are going to ask. What's real in the book? Whenever I'm reading a book that's like an alternate history, I want to know what's real and what's not real. Okay, so um, what's real is the wars. There really were Napoleonic Wars. That whole premise that there were Napoleonic Wars in which Britain fought against France, totally true. We just learned about the Napoleonic Wars. And I think it means, I think the book means more when you understand what and how long and drawn out this thing was. Like we're all sick of quarantine after just a few months and these wars went on for over a decade. There were coalitions and many of the Napoleonic Wars were named after them. This, as I mentioned earlier, this particular book opens in the third coalition, the War of the Third Coalition. That's when this book is taking place, the War of the Third Coalition. And that war was fought between 1803 and 1806. And in that war, in the War of the Third Coalition, it was Napoleon against everyone. So he was against the United Kingdom. He was against Austria, which we already mentioned was super powerful this time. He was against the Holy Roman Empire, and he was against Russia. So, yeah. Next, what is, and in fact, yeah, Britain fought in six of these seven coalitions, and this is the third one. So... The next thing is real is the Battle of Trafalgar. The Battle of Trafalgar will take place in this book that we're reading, and it took place in history. Near the, it's going to be near the end of the book. It is real and very, very important. So real is the way that Britain at the in the early 19th century, so the early 1800s, the way that it is portrayed, very, very accurate in its like attitudes and social structures. All of that is very, very real. Okay. Who's real and who's fake? So the real characters who will show up in here. Um, on the left, Horatio Nelson, Admiral Lord Nelson. Um, he, this guy is amazing. He, if you, if you want to read about an interesting guy, go read about Lord Nelson. I mean, he will blow your mind. And um, he, in the thing that's different is in this book, he survives the Battle of Trafalgar. In real life, he does not. Okay, another one is um, the person on the far right, the other color picture. That's William Wilberforce. Some of you may have seen the movie Amazing Grace that was made about him. He was one of the very, uh, a lot of people credit him with ending the slave trade in Britain. And he was adamant about, he was an ardent abolitionist and he features in the book, and he's real. And then the other person is the middle person, um, which is William Cornwallis, and another Admiral William Cornwallis. And so um, I'm looking over to see if I have any other notes here. I, I really would recommend go read, go read, just even read a little bit, just read the Wikipedia entry or like on Britannica a biography of Lord Nelson because he's just so amazing. Yeah, I see a couple of you commenting. I mean, he was just astonishing. Um, so this is 
a painting of the Battle of Trafalgar, and it's done by a very famous British painter, um, J.W. Turner, and it shows the last three letters are flying on, on the flags in, in these nautical flags, the last three letters of the signal, which was a quote that um, Admiral Nelson was famous for, which was, England expects that every man will do his duty, and this is his ship victory. And so he, he um, it's showing the last three letters of that signal flying from the flag. This is a shout out to Admiral Nelson. And then um, what is also real in the story is Temeraire. So this is the name that Captain Lawrence gives the dragon. But Temeraire, the HMS Temeraire, was actually shown here, right back here. This is Temeraire. Um, she was a ship, and she actually fought during the Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars. But mostly she just did, like, convoy duty, convoy escort duty, and blockades and stuff. She wasn't really famous for battle. In fact, she really only fought one fleet action, and that was at the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, but because she became so well known and subsequent artistic depictions of the battle showed her um, uh, like being amazing, and she was amazing, I'll tell you a little bit about it, but she was so amazing that she is now, she's known as the Fighting Temeraire. Yeah, isn't it a beautiful, um, beautiful painting? So this is another painting of um, Temeraire in the middle of the... Um, Battle of Trafalgar. So I want to read to you what happened here. So she rammed into Redoubtable, which was a French ship, dismounting many of the French ship's guns and worked her way alongside. So she goes along, sails alongside the ship she rams on purpose. And then her crew lashes the two ships together. She literally, Temeraire, ties herself to the French ship, to the enemy. And... Um, and at the same time, at the same time, a Spanish ship with 112 guns called the Santa Ana comes along behind her and another French ship called the Fougueux comes along and they're all firing on her all at once. It is like so incredible. And you know what she does? She broadsides another one of the ships and ties herself to that one too. And she's just all guns blazing. It is so, so, so amazing. She was caught between the two ships almost on purpose. And then, um, oh, I got ahead of myself, but the captain of, the, of Temeraire said, said to his, he wrote this in a letter to his wife, perhaps never was a ship so circumstance as mine to have for more than three hours two of the enemy's line of battleships lashed to her. Hundreds of people died. Hundreds of people were wounded and they other people on the other ships were throwing grenades down onto the deck of Temeraire and at one point it caused her rigging to catch on fire and they halted the battle for a minute so that they could put out the fire. Even the enemy stopped because they were all tied together and if she went down they were all going down. I mean it was amazing. Um, and she narrowly escaped destruction because someone on the Redoubtable threw a grenade right onto her main deck and it exploded and it ignited the aftermath. I mean, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. So she was, you know how Wilbur in um, Charlotte's Web is some pig? Temeraire, she's some ship. She is some ship. And that's what is, um, that is what is so cool about the name of the dragon and why when you, I've mentioned this before, you guys, when an author, when an author names something, go look it up. Like, why did they pick this name? It's not by accident, right? It's not by accident. Okay. So yes, no, excited, ready to read the book. I'm curious. Are you guys looking forward to it now? Are you guys looking forward to it now? I'm so excited. I've been reading it, ready to see. I know. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't want her to... Well, it wasn't that they didn't want her to be destroyed so they could continue fighting. It was they didn't want her to be destroyed so they didn't die too. Some ship. Yes, yes, there's another hashtag. Good. Curious whether you are interested now for next week. Excited about the book? Next week, chapters one through five. If you need the flyer again. Yes, yes, Cloudfall. A dragon is an airship. Exactly. You got it. You got it. Dragon is an airship. That's exactly.
Okay, so um, if you need the whole flyer, there's the link. We're going to read chapters one through five. And oh, you know what I didn't bring? Oh, you guys, I brought, I have this bag that I brought over all the stuff that I needed to do this. But you know what I forgot? My dragon puppet. So stay tuned. I ordered a dragon puppet just for this book. So you will see it next week. Remember when you're reading, going to be looking through the prism of friendship, luck, and strategy. So be looking for how the friendships design. Erin, I want to see your designs. Totally want to see your designs. Um, your, I want to have you be looking for instances of friendship and how it develops and people who maybe are not your friends. And then the role of luck and strategy. Okay. Can I interest you in a challenge? <gasps> I'm really excited about this. Yes, I have a dragon puppet. It's so cool. Okay, but let me tell you about this challenge. I'm really excited about the challenge. Okay, when I was a little girl, this is me in a picture with my mom when I was five years old. And when I was five years old, my local library in San Clemente, California, held a contest at Halloween time, and it was the Name the Witch contest. And I named the witch, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I have a feeling that my mother came up with the name for the witch, but in any event, <laughs> um, I named the witch Grizzly Griselda. And Cookie Cookie, yes, anybody who wants to design some merch, Show me designs, just email them to me. It will be super exciting. Aunt Erin wants to work on that too, so super exciting. Okay, so name the dragon. I I named the witch, and I won a book, Richard Scarry's um, best word book ever. I still remember it. I bought it already for my granddaughter. And what you are going to do is name a dragon. I want you to come up with a name for a dragon. So what you're going to do when you go to this link is it's a Google form and it will explain what you do. And yes, you're gonna name your, I'm gonna take whatever name you choose. I'm gonna name the dragon puppet and the winner will get a little prize. So there is a little prize and everybody can only enter one time. Um, yeah, we'll, I'll tell you what the prize is next week after I do it, but I, I know what the prize is, but I don't wanna say yet. Um, but the um you're gonna go into the google form and you have to be signed into google to do it because it only lets you do it one time and you say the name of the dragon and you have to tell me your email address so i can notify you if you're the winner the link isn't working yet Ooh. um let me go let me go figure that out because it should absolutely be working let me go get that right now let me um I may not have the, uh, it should be, I tested it. Let's see here. Is anybody else having trouble with it? Let me see. I'll go test. Um, I will, it, well, it has a bunch of clicks already. Let's see here. I'm seeing it, so it's working for me. Um, if it's not working for you, maybe log into Google first, not sure. Um, you shouldn't have to request access. Well, let me go. You shouldn't have to request access. I must have done something wrong. So let me fix the settings on it. So give me a couple minutes when class is over to um, to fix the settings. Um, but that will be it. Uh, let's see. I don't want that. Shouldn't have done. It shouldn't be making you do that. Hmm. Well, I'll work on that, you guys. I'm sorry. I won't keep you while I try to figure that out. But I will I will try to... Yeah, I, the permissions are a little bit weird on the forms, but I'll go work on that because I thought I had it all right, but we'll get it fixed. So you go ahead. I'll get it fixed here in the next few minutes, and um, I will... Um, and then I will wait to see your answers. All right, so next week, same back time, same back channel. I'm going to go um, go fix that so that you guys can get in. I can't wait to see your dragon names, and I can't wait to see next week what you think about the first section of this book. Okay, I will see you next week, same back time, same back channel. And I'm going to go fix our dragon contest right away.